Okay, welcome back everybody from lunch. Um, did everyone enjoy their lunch? Good, good. I actually uh, do want to take a second to thank uh, all the DFG staff for organizing what I think you'll agree is a first class conference in great food, so thanks everyone. So next up, uh, this is a great speaker, Tim Ash. Um, he is a recognized expert on landing page optimization and conversion tools. He's currently CEO of Site Tuners. He's also the author of the best-selling book, Landing Page Optimization, which he has some copies available at the end of his presentation that uh, he, I think, is willing to sign and give away. And he'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but he also wanted to let me know that he's an acclaimed salsa dancer. So maybe he'll do a few moves up here. Um, so today he'll be sharing his insights on how to salsa. I'm sorry, no. And today he'll be sharing his insights into landing page optimization best practices and how to leverage conversion tools. Welcome, Tim. Thanks very much, Scott. Good afternoon, everybody. Oh, that was kind of weak. Let's try that again. Good afternoon, everybody. Much better. I heard domainers were a fun crowd. I've heard about the crazy parties, the uh, Playboy Mansion you were all kicked out of last year, all that good stuff. So I was expecting a little more enthusiasm and energy in the room. Um, if you like what I'm saying, I think we're going to put it up on the monitor here in a second. Please uh, tweet the crap out of this, at Tim underscore Ash. If you don't like what I'm saying, do the same. OK, so uh, I'm going to just get started by telling you a little bit about what we do. And that's just going to take 30 seconds, but my VP of Biz Dev said I had to put this slide up. So we help large and small companies essentially improve the efficiency of their landing pages and websites. And we can do that two ways. We can just fix the obvious to us problems via best practices redesigns, or we can test different versions of content on your site to see what your audience prefers. So blah, 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 big clients, blah, blah, blah. OK, this is what I'm really here to tell you is a story in three parts. And here's part one. You're all pissing money down the toilet. No, oh, I mean it. OK, so let's see. Just to make my point, you're pissing money down the toilet. Now, OK, I figured you know, when in Rome, insult the Romans. That's what I was told. This would go over really well with you guys. No, but, but I mean it. I'm serious. Part one, no, real money. You know. That should have been more targeted. I like that. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Pachumpa, rim shot, right? But what, what do I mean by this? Uh, well, you're nice people, and you work hard, but most of your business is this. You know what that is? Buying a plot of land. Many of you have plots of lands. Most of them aren't near an interstate or any human habitation. So it's a beautiful plot of land, right? And maybe in 20 years, it'll be worth more than you paid for it. And that's good enough for some. Now, whose business model is that in the room? Be honest. Just going to buy a domain and sell it eventually. All right, right? OK, thanks for your honesty, sir. OK, but then some of you get really smart. And then you put up a billboard. Yeah, we're going to park that domain and we're going to monetize it by having people send traffic to it. And then we'll resell that to Google. Who thinks Google does good and does no evil? How many of you are seeing rising margins on the part of your business affected by Google? No? Just thought I'd ask. Do no evil to Google's bottom line. That's their real motto, OK? Just in case you're wondering. So what's wrong with billboards? Well, nothing. You know what? If you put up a billboard near a highway, that's great. If you have a premium domain name, you're rocking. And you have to do nothing else rather than buy the land and put up the billboard. If you, in fact, if you did that in Santa Monica, say 40, 50 years ago, you'd be a very happy camper. And even the parking lot or the billboard across the street right there on Pacific Coast Highway would generate a lot of money for you, right? OK, now whose business model have I described in the room? Come on, be honest. Parking. Who does mostly parking of their domains? Well, I'm here to tell you, it's not enough, folks. It's not enough. And you know, it seems funny because 
my PR people tell me I have to wear this suit and I'm obviously still working for a living. Many of you are just here for shits and giggles and flew here on your Learjet, right? But, so here I am telling you this stuff, but it's not enough. In two, three years, you're gonna be facing very hard times if this is all you ever plan to do. And I heard about this on the panel that we had just before lunch, right? You have to go upstream. You have to go to the harder stuff. You start to actually make your properties worth something independent of Google, in, you have to add value, you have to build things, you have to invest in them, right? Now, I think about as far as most of you have gotten in the room, I was talking to, uh, I think it was Peter or Steve earlier, he's saying, who, who's got the, the Romanian content creation team? Or many of you do, okay, maybe that's not just narrowing it down, but in any case, he says they, they write content for websites in Google speak. It's not English, it's Google speak, right? You have to correct the grammar once in a while. Uh, but you, know, you throw up enough blog posts up there and all of a sudden you, know, you can monetize it with AdWords, right? Is that building a real asset? That's my question. Is that valuable? Now I don't mean valuable to you because I'm sure that kind of refines it a little more and makes it more valuable. I mean to people, for real. Someone in Romania wrote a blog post on a topic you told them to and it's valuable to me? No, not enough value. So if you're really gonna be doing this, you're gonna have to get in the construction business. And I'm talking skyscrapers. I'm not talking single family homes. You have to add value. You actually have to create something that's lasting and durable and can be sold. Not because there's another one, what is it, P.T. Barnum said, born every minute, right? Just willing to pay a little more for the domain name. Or I was talking to Ed at lunch and he was saying, yeah, you know, we tell them our growth projections before we even launch the site and then threaten them and then say, hey, you're gonna pay a lot more for us in a year or two. But you know, in between those parts is still the execution phase that you have to go through. But you really, really have to think about how do I add value to actual people? Who's prepared to do that in this room? Okay, seven, eight, uh, 14 of you. Okay, all right, um, I'm gonna save the rest of you some time. The rest of this presentation is not for you. If you wanna go set up a meeting or just enjoy the LA weather, feel free. I won't be offended, honestly, okay. But th that's what I'm here to talk about. The fact is, this is like refining ore. If you start, I'm gonna monetize, I'm gonna arbitrage. Monetize means different things. I've never heard monetize used, I have to say, in a more peculiar manner than in this industry. Okay, monetize is okay, we'll arbitrage Google AdWords, we will get someone to pay per click, that'd be even better, right? Uh, or, hey, you know, maybe on a CPA basis, monetize means we'll put up blog posts. No, I'm talking about vertical integration. Why don't you build a brand? Why don't you collect the leads? That refined stuff is worth a lot more. Get vertically integrated. Don't depend on Google. Depend on the actual quality of your content. So if you're not willing to go upstream, you're gonna lose. It's that simple, you have to keep swimming upstream. You can coast for a long time. I've seen it in other industries, gambling, adult, people that were early in in those industries, and maybe some of you are in this room. You, know, you can coast for five years. Okay, it's not 20 million I made this year, it's only 17. Okay, it's only 12 the next year. Now it's still enough but not forever. All right, so, part two of my, of my three act play. Stand up, please. Stand up, someone. I can see you, come on. Okay, all of you, yes. Okay, now, now raise your hand and say, my baby is ugly, say it loud. My baby is ugly. Thank you, okay, you can sit down now. Now, what do I mean by that? My baby is ugly. How many of you are parents in the room? Raise your hand and keep them up. Okay, how many of you think your baby is ugly? Keep your hand up. <laughs> what just happened? Have you ever seen any ugly babies? Yeah, yeah, that's where ugly adults come from, right? I mean, it's not like some mystery, right? So why is it that, oh, the, the, none of the parents in this room think their baby is ugly? Why is that? Well, there's only one rational explanation, and what's that? The parents are deluded. Okay, my babies are beautiful, by the way. They really are. Other people say so. But your babies are ugly. 
No, but the parents are deluded. It's the only explanation. And you've fallen in love with your creation. You think your website, your landing pages, they're beautiful. I'm here to tell you they're not, okay? So what I'm gonna do is just run you through some quick tips of problems that we commonly see on websites and landing pages. And you may recognize yourself in some of these, okay? So I want you to think, okay, ha ha, this is gonna, gonna be fun in games until someone loses an eye, but does this apply to your site, okay? Number one, these are five tips, best practices. Number one, make your call to action clear. Seems like an obvious thing. What do you want me to do here? Quick, shout it out if you can figure it out. What do they want you to do on this page? No, they don't want you to call, although it's in red letters. Okay, what else? Bounce, no, that's not an option. I mean, it will happen, but it's not what they want you to do. Anybody else? Free trial. Free trial, who said that? Okay, have you heard my presentation before? No. no. Okay, uh, do you have an iPhone? Yes. Okay, that, that explains it. Is the only people that ever get this right are the iPhone users, because the 30-day free trial is on the iPhone, folks. It's on the iPhone, isn't that obvious? Well, we have Vanna White over here, and we're holding the laptop, there's screenshots that are illegible of their reports, whatever they are. There's all this text that nobody's reading. But no, the iPhone is what they want you to click on. Isn't it obvious that it's clickable? What? Not so much? Okay, you can laugh. Here's the punchline. This is a landing page for Google AdWords. They're paying to drive traffic to this page. Don't be that guy. Number two. Ask for less information. Now, in a normal setting, well, let's say I walked into a bar and I said, hi, can I have your phone number? Would that be okay with you? Not so much. Yeah, I was like, yeah, no, you're a creepy dude on stage. Get away from me. Okay. It's, it's out of order, right? It's too early in the process. I'm asking for too much information. If I walked into a store, right, and, or you walked into my store, sir, and I said, hi, welcome. May I hold your credit card while you shop? Is that okay with you? Sure, okay, yeah. It's like a new twist on the Walmart greeter, right? It's like, go direct for the pocketbook. No, but okay, but yet as marketers, we are greedy. We're greedy marketers. Raise your hand. Raise your hand, do it. Say, I'm a greedy marketer. No, that wasn't convincing enough. Say, okay, I'm have you do this after this segment and you tell me if it's true. How's that? That's fair, right? Okay, this is a landing page for Adobe and their landing page testing tool. Okay, that's a white paper. You see the headline of that white paper? It says, rethinking the role of the landing pages in conversion. And then they proceed to ask you a bazillion things. Uh, see if I can read these over here. I'm gonna come over, I don't know if you can track me. All right, let's see, first name, last name, email, phone, company, website, country, department slash function, job title, primary site objective, industry, and relationship to Omniture. Well, <laughs> I didn't even know I was in a relationship with Omniture which, by the way, got bought by Adobe, so it's no longer Omniture anyway. Is this okay? Now, folks, if, you, if I come to your site, I'm willing to take a standing broad jump. Okay, I'm even willing to take a three-foot standing broad jump, but I'm not even gonna try the 30-foot standing broad jump. You know, it's good. That's about as good as I can do. Okay, that's it. I'm not gonna try anything bigger. So don't ask me, do you really need this information? I don't think so. Ask for it in stages. Have your IT guys earn their pay. Here's an example. One of our clients, Hearing Planet, right? Hearing aids, leads for hearing aids. They wanna sell you hearing aids. So the, they have a great bribe. Seth Godin in his book, Permission Marketing, talks about basically in, bribing people to, it's gotta be more for them than you're getting out of it. So great bribe, buyer's guide to hearing aids. Download, look at what they're asking for in that form. Tell me anyone who can spot a problem. Raise your hand and just tell, shout it out. What's the problem here? Yes, sir. Phone number. Yeah, they're, they're going to send me an ebook. Right? What else? Alternate phone number. Yeah, okay. Address. Address, folks. It's a freaking ebook. Why do you need my address? Is that a bit invasive? Yeah, it's invasive. Do you need my address to send me an ebook? What is the minimum amount of information you need to let me download that white paper? You know, I actually had high hopes for you guys, but I know you're still digesting your lunch, so I'm gonna give you a little slack. 
Greedy marketers. Greedy marketers. Email address, name and email. Why? Let me download the ebook. You don't need my email address. You need that sense of control that you get by asking me for my email address. But isn't it even more effective? Look, this is a, an ebook that's going to be handed around that goes to my insurance company, that goes to my care provider, that goes to my aging parents, well, everybody that needs it. Wouldn't you rather there were more of those thought leadership ebooks circulating out there than you having the email address? And guess what? I still have your ebook. And in three months when I'm ready, I'll click on the link inside the ebook that says schedule your hearing exam as the next step and go to your scheduling page. What did you need my email address for? Don't be greedy. Now, they were, and they said, well, for our business model, we can't get rid of all that stuff. So how many of you would like a 17% increase in your business revenue? Get rid of the email address, I mean, get rid of the mailing address. That's what they did. They got a 17% boost in book downloads. I bet if they didn't ask for email, they could go up another two, three, five fold. Who knows? You see the, the power of not asking for information? Give to get. Give me a better bribe than you're asking for in return. And in return means the hassle of filling out your form, the time I have to spend doing it, you know, thinking about it at all. Those are all costs to me. Very expensive costs, by the way. When on the internet, we all have the attention span of a lit match, right? We're in a highly activated state. We're clicking around. We have a, a, a sea, an infinite sea of information and alternative sources for that information. Why would we fill out this form? Look, I mean, worse yet, why would we fill out that form? It looks even more imposing, right? Here's another example. This is for uh, lead generation in, in debt negotiation, right? So they'll sell your lead to a debt negotiation company. Now, take a look at this. What do they ask for? Uh, last name, spouse, <laughs> first name. I, I don't get the order of that, but okay. Um, email, work phone, home phone, cell phone, best time to call, blah, blah, blah. Huh? And we ask them, what do you do with this information? You know what they said? Anybody? Yeah, they sell it, but before they sell it, what do they have to do? They call them. They call them to qualify every lead because if they sell crap leads, they're going to be out of business. So they call every lead. And so we said, what is the minimum of information you need to know, to basically know whether it's worth even calling them? And that's what ended up on the winning page. Now this one we did in a multivariate test. There are about a million different versions of this. But that's the winning page. Now look at what they're asking for in this form. Name, first name, last name, email, so the contact info, phone, state because they have different legal requirements and amount of debt. If you don't have over 10,000 in debt, we don't even want to talk to you. It's not worth the phone call, right? And look, a lot of other things have changed on the page. It's a different happy, smiling couple picture and trust symbols added, which I'll talk about. But that's a 51% increase in the efficiency of that campaign. They're spending hundreds of thousands a month on pay-per-click traffic to go to this page. And that, by the way, was across the board, including 800 phone calls, which are even more valuable to them, toll-free phone calls, okay? $48 million a year, top-line revenue, which, by the way, is also bottom-line revenue because there is no incremental cost associated with lead gen. They already paid for the traffic. This is just extra juice they're squeezing out of it. Number three. Cut down on your text. Is there anyone in the room that can read that, by the way? Looks like Polish or Czech to me. I know we have a very international crowd here. Canyon Tours, anyone? Whoa, what are you laughing? Look, I mean, it says right there that uh, Canyon Tours uh, offers 180 tours and activities at the Grand Canyon, tours by bus, airplane, helicopter, train, RV, donkey, right on the back of a Native American. I don't know, but who's reading that? Anybody? How many of you have seen the old uh, Charlie Brown cartoons? And then the, the teacher's talking in the front of the classroom, and whenever an adult talks in Charlie Brown, what do the kids hear? Wah, 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 right? That trombone sound, right? 
This is the web equivalent of wah, 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 wah. Nobody reads on the web. Dr. Jacob Nielsen, who's keynoted at my conversion conference before, has done study after study about this, going back at, at least a decade. It hasn't changed. People don't read on the web. So why would you expect your visitors to be so uniquely interested in your content that they would put up with this crap? Look, I, I know your seventh grade grammar teacher would be proud. Hey, Susie finally learned to write in complete sentences and paragraphs. Don't do it. Don't do it on the web. Cut down your text. Retention goes up, conversion goes up. If you want to hide stuff for the methodical people under a more details link, great, they'll find it because they're methodical. But don't clutter it up for the rest of us people that have ADD like me. Rack mounted servers, anyone? Now, I know that's pretty geeky, but a newsflash as a recovering technologist myself, geeks don't like to have their time wasted either. This is not okay. This is okay. Is there a lot of text on that page? That's the home page of 37 Signals. They sell various kinds of, kind of on-demand collaborative software. Is it pretty clear you have four choices without reading? Yes? Okay. Okay, what are the choices? They're in red. Manage projects, manage contacts, share internally, work in real time. Duh. Now, if you're interested in any of those things, you'll go to the subpage, and then they can have all the detail in the world, right? But are they doing it on their home page? No. Keep your promises. Number four, who here was raised by wolves? Anybody? Okay, well, thank you for your honesty, ma'am. Uh, <laughs> your mom probably told you, keep your promises, right? It's one of those nice things to do, and you should be doing it. But we don't always do it. Let me show you a quick example. I happen to Google best digital camera, which, by the way, Andy, can you hold that up? Is Nikon. Any Canon people in the room? Okay, well, we'll fight it out later. All right, anyway. That's all right, everyone can have, make mistakes once in a while. All right, so let's say we look at this pay-per-click ad that came up under that. Now let's deconstruct this best digital camera. Get expert reviews of digital cameras from consumer reports. Who thinks that's a trustworthy ad? Have you heard of consumer reports? They're one of the top kind of consumer reporting agencies in, in the US. They rank various uh, products. They don't take advertising, right? Hey. Does that set a high expectation for you or a low one? High, right? And what do you expect to see on the next page? Expert reviews of top digital cameras. Okay, let's go to the next page. There it is. Okay, now let's look at the top and it says, okay, top rated digital cameras. Cool, so far so good. Uh, over 56 models you know, compared, great. Now they have them in all the brands, great, major brands. So far, so good. And then you get to this. This little red button. And it says, join today. Okay. Now, what does that really mean? Pay us, right? Take out your wallet and pay us now. Now, OK, let's go back, because maybe we missed something. What did they promise us on this previous page? Expert reviews. Hmm, OK, let's fast forward. Join today. Is there a problem here? Yeah, a big one. The people that are buying the pay-per-click traffic to the center of this page are dropping it off at the door and saying to the landing page people, you carry it in, now it's your problem. See the disconnect? It's like, I didn't just show up on this page. It's not like I teleported onto the holodeck of the Starship Enterprise, right? I didn't do that. I had it in a context. I came from somewhere. An intent was set, somewhere upstream. And then they lied to me. And here I am, I probably told tens of thousands of people over the years, consumer reports are liars. It's true. Do you want that to happen to the, the, the precious traffic you're landing on your page? So go upstream, figure out the psychology of those people, the messaging that happened up there. What is their expectation? Number one driver of conversion, write this down if you're taking notes. Number one driver of conversion is matching people's intent. Did you deliver on their expectation? It doesn't matter if it's crazy or irrational, okay? It just matters if you match their intent or not. Number five, make your trust visible. There's been some research out of a Canadian university that says people will form a first impression of a landing page in 50 milliseconds. That's fast. 
That's about as fast as your visual processing works in the brain, right? So we can't spoof it. We can't you know, do anything to fake it out. It's basically subliminal, automatic. And the problem is that it affects the likelihood of conversion. If I see your site as cheesy or uncredible, you have a problem. So how can we deal with this? Well, here's one way. This one of our clients, Real Age, they have this health questionnaire called the Real Age Quiz. And you answer all these questions about your lifestyle and your medical history, you know, whether you drink or smoke and do drugs, whatever. And then they tell you your real age, not your biological age or chronological age, but your biological age. It's great, right? After last night, some of you may not want to take the test. OK, just wait a little while. But so we did this test. And we put up those media mentions. They've been mentioned in all of these news outlets. 40% more people filled out that same questionnaire on that page. Why? Because of trust. Do you trust? How many of you have heard of CNN? New York Times, anyone? Good Morning America? I mean, right? These are media brands. They've been drumming their brands into our heads for decades. Hundreds of millions of dollars spent doing that. And how many of you have heard of real age before today? Nobody. Oh, well, three or four of you. OK, almost nobody. You're always at the center of the trouble. I can tell. OK. Um, so what, what does that mean? Well, you can get a halo effect. You can borrow trust from other brands. Now, this works in a business to business setting, too. This is one of our clients, SF Video. They do large scale DVD and Blu ray duplication. And they had this landing page, and we tested it. And this was the winning version, the one that was 58% better. What's most of the page taken up by? Well, it's not the lead form. It's their client logos, right? So if you come to this page, think about it. You want to get DVDs duplicated or Blu-ray, right? I bet your thought track's going something like this. Wow, these guys work with Walmart and ABC and AT&T. I hope they work with my little itty bitty company on my little itty bitty duplication job, right? I hope they take a client as small as my company. Because folks, is there any question that they can deliver? No. All they did was put up some client logos. Here's another form of trust and credibility building. One, at one point, I was interested in downloading the latest version of the uh, Firefox browser, right? It's about six weeks after it launched. And I'm kind of you know, poking around their site, went a little deeper, and I came to this page. And I saw this. 543,943,166 people have downloaded this latest version of Firefox in the last six weeks. Now I'm thinking, man, should I download it or not? <laughs> You know, it's, it's not too tough to figure it out. But they're doing the double whammy here, because they also had an interactive map. And I was in Germany at the time. And, and, that, and that interactive map you know, had these dots that were blinking on and off anytime somewhere in the world somebody downloaded Firefox. And I'm thinking, oh, Central Europe, like right around me in Germany right now, lots of people are downloading this. So what happens in our mind? Why is this important? Well, if lots of people, just like me, have done this and had a good outcome, that serves as a shortcut to my own decision making, right? We're all too busy. Our brain evolved to take shortcuts. They work most of the time. Sometimes there are catastrophic effects if it doesn't work, but we have to take shortcuts. A brand is nothing more than a shortcut. Social proof and the behavior of our peers is nothing more than a shortcut. You need to have it on your page, though. OK, I'm going to give you another example. Another client of ours, Credo Mobile, they're up in the Bay Area. And this is a landing page that they're using for an in-house list. They're kind of a socially responsible cell phone company. Okay, and so this is an offer. You know, switch phone companies, buy this phone. How many of you think that's a credible and professional looking landing page? Raise your hand. Yeah, it is, right? I'd run with that page. So we identified some problems with them. One of them was that how many of you have heard of Credo Mobile before? No one in this room. OK, I guess there's no left-leaning NPR listening types. Oh, I'm sorry, one person Okay, the, that, the, in this crowd. OK, well, they give a lot of money to charity. That's their stick. 2 to 3% of revenue goes to charity, to progressive causes. So we redesigned their page. And this was the one that we came up with based on best practices. Now, a lot of things have changed. But one of the things I want you to notice is on the right-hand side here, the logos of the companies that they give 
charity too. How many of you have heard of Greenpeace or Planned Parenthood or Doctors Without Borders, right? Everybody. How many of you heard of Credo Mobile? Steve. Right? Well, okay. I can't, I can't. <laughs> I can only do so much, okay? We work in Photoshop primarily. That's about as far as it goes. So, but the, we, we, to verify this, we ran it through our attention wizard tool, which I'll talk about towards the end of the presentation. But uh, we can essentially predict where someone's going to look on a landing page. You just upload a screenshot or an image. And so these were the hotspots all over the page. Now, one of the bad things here, of course, is that there's no activation on the call to action, and most of these big hotspots are just artifacts of their visual design and their designer going a little crazy with the background colors. But anyway, so here's the, the screenshot of the attention wizard heat map for the new page. Now, we very carefully designed this page and went through several iterations to get it to this. But look, there's a hot spot on the phone and the little call out offer. There's a hot spot on the call to action button. And there's a very deliberate hot spot at the head of that list. So your eye just goes over there and you notice it, right? Not a lot, not disproportionate, but if you actually look at this, did you see how we have the green piece a little darker, a little more contrast? You see your eye goes to it compared to the others? The rest are pretty subtle, grayscale treatments, right? Anybody want to guess at the difference in performance of these two pages? Anybody? Percent? 20. OK, who else? 50, okay, who else? 200, okay, who else? 75, you're not eligible. Sorry, nice try. Anybody else? Say 75. Okay, 75, sir, thank you. Yeah. No, it was only 84%. I'm sorry to disappoint the person who said 200. Only 84% by adding trust to a page? Think about it, how hard was that? Ooh, you had to monochrome those logos and lower their contrast. By the way, for your trouble, sir, I'm going to give you this copy of the book. I'll be glad to sign it later. But yeah. it's more valuable than, than that, all that money I threw out because that stuff won't even buy you half a mojito in the lobby bar. So anyway. OK, OK, fair enough. We fixed all the obvious problems with the page. But I bet you dollars to donuts that most of that increase was due to the trust symbols. But thank you. We, we like to think we know what we're doing. And then because we live in a bubble, we can. Part three, the closing act of our play. Become a conversion ninja. Who's willing to do that? No, stand up if you're willing to do it. If you're going to be a ninja, you've got to get your ass off the seat. OK. Now look, this is public proof that you're going to be a conversion ninja. Those of you, the rest of you, OK. There's the few and the proud, and then there's the rest of you. OK. No, I'm just kidding. All of you need to become conversion ninjas. So I'm going to give you some tools. By the way, these are dirt cheap or free, and they're easy to use, so you're running out of excuses here to help you improve your conversion rates or to find problems with your page. Now, one of them is Crazy Egg. How many of you are familiar with this or use it? OK, a few of you. All right. So one of the things it can do is basically track things that are going on inside your page. So it's not web analytics, it's in-page analytics, much more granular, right? So we're tracking mouse movement, scrolling, clicking on stuff, not clicking on stuff. So here's some of the things you can do. Weird fact, true science though, about 5% of people will use their mouse as a pointer. Wherever they're looking, they will point their mouse and the cursor on the page. Helps them focus, I guess, okay? So you get enough people on your page. Most of us leave it alone. There's no mouse movement unless we intend to do something. The rest of them are using it as a pointer. So you get these hot spots of attention that you can predict after a while you know, where people are looking. So you get this kind of distribution, this kind of poor man's eye tracking, if you will. Okay. Now here's where people click on the page. Now I want to show you something. So actually watch this image. Now see the click pattern? There's navigation at the top. People are clicking on this button. A few people are clicking in that input field and a few down below in the browse by category, okay? Now what's different from that page to this one? Well, most of it's the same, but people are actually clicking the search button now, whereas before they weren't. And they're using the navigation at the bottom of the page more, whereas before they weren't so much. What changed here? 
browser resolution. You see that little thing right there? That's a smaller screen size. This is on a bigger screen size. People are actually seeing that by category navigation. They're noticing the search much more. It's not below the fold for them. But very different behavior. Now, is this scientific? No, but can you see a qualitative difference between this and this, if you just blink them on and off, can you see what's changing in terms of, not just the number of clicks, but the density, right? It's changing because we're, we're segmenting it out based on the, on the size of the person's browser and their screen, how big their open window is. So with the bigger window, they're able to notice more things on the bottom of the page, and they start using it differently. These are good things to know. Maybe we should design our page differently. Maybe we should push important stuff higher up on the page. Hey, you know, how much dead space is there here? Look at all this vertical space below that button. That's just dead air, folks, right? You don't need that. Could you redesign it easily? Okay. Cross-browser testing. How many of you have a usability lab with Macs and PCs and Linux p machines and different browser sizes? You do? Wow, lucky. Okay, good, good for you. Rest of us can't afford it. But do you like getting that call? Hey, it doesn't work on Safari. Who likes getting that call? How many of us have gotten that call, though? Fire drill, time to do something about it, right? Well, no, not really. You can test it. You can buy time on other people's machines and just try different op uh, operating systems and browser configurations and see how it looks. It lets you easily identify usability issues with different screen sizes or distorted spatial relationships. Now, I hear a lot about Amazon. We we're talking at the uh, expert lunch today about, well, shouldn't we just copy what Amazon does? You know, it's like a knee-jerk reaction. Well, here's an example of Amazon's homepage. And up top, this was taken a while ago, but they're talking about the new uh, <laughs> Blackberry phones and how cool they are, right? But that's a readable paragraph. Everybody would agree. And then down below, it says, why did you know that Amazon sells boxing equipment? Well, no, I didn't, but anyway, so there you go, three boxing equipments. All right, now, that looks like an okay page, right? Here's what it looked like on my 24-inch monitor. Is that okay? No, that's no longer a paragraph, folks. That's two really long lines. If you're going beyond 45 to 60 characters per line, you have a big problem because the eye can't reset and, and distinguish where the start of the next line is. That's bizarre. And then down in the bottom, we have giant air gaps between those pictures, right? Think about it. Why? They know I'm on a big monitor. You know, put them together, center them, put more in between. I don't know, but that just looks retarded. No offense meant to, to retarded people. Okay, so what can you do with cross-browser testing? You can set up any machine with any combination of software that's reasonable. So I want to see this on IE6, which is everybody's bane of everyone's existence, because it's still out there, with JavaScript turned off. Okay, now what kind of user experience do we have? I don't know, we'll go find out. Um, quick disclaimer, I have a financial interest in Attention Wizard, we developed it but I think it's a really cool tool, so I'm gonna tell you about it anyway. Now, I showed it to you earlier. Basically what we can do, based on neuroscience research and visual attention and what we know about it, is predict about 75% correlation to eye tracking where someone's gonna look on your landing page. Now the beauty of this is you don't even have to be live with the page. Who was I talking to, John, are you in the room? Yeah, okay, John uh, uses it to design his landing pages before he launches them. So fine tunes it, just like I showed you in that Credo Mobile example. Why would you piss money down the toilet, which again, you're all doing, uh, when you can at least launch with a page that has the visual attention on the right parts of the page, right? So you don't need a live page. You don't need eye tracking. You don't need mouse tracking. You can just test it. And don't let your visual designers go wild. Who's here is involved in the actual visual design of your pages? Okay, or manages those folks. Okay, all right, I'm just gonna say this. You know, whatever they do on the weekend is fine. Go to a rave, get your nipple pierced, it doesn't matter, but when you come back on Monday morning, did I just say that out loud? Um, you have to work inside the box, not outside the box. The box is the bank vault where your company puts their profits. You have to work inside the box, okay? Unfortunately, Visual designers get bored, they, you know, they, they flunked out of art school, they're frustrated, they, they have to earn a living designing websites, that's no fun. 
oh, not that same green continue button again, right? So they tend to illustrate and decorate and completely destroy the visual relationship of things on the page. So I'm an artist myself and a photographer, but I'll tell you, I'll be the first to tell you, keep them on a short leash, folks. Here's an example. Big company, how many of you heard of 1-800-Flowers? Hey, pretty good domain name, right? Okay, they do about a billion a year, 300 million of it, I think, through their online catalog, last I heard. This is the product detail page on their site. Let me put that another way. This is the page you have to go through if you want to give them your money. I challenge you, tell me what do they want you to do on this page? Shout it out. Uh, that's not shouting. <laughs> Buy roses, but, well, okay, yeah, but how? So, oh, who's the genius that said that? On the end there, sir. Coming your way. <laughs> Didn't make it. You can come back and get that. I'll sign it. Hope, hope that makes up for it. Could, did everybody get this? This is the intended call to action on the page. Wasn't that clear? This little light violet button, view delivery dates. Now look at that, giant roses picture, just in case you're clueless about what part of the site you're in. Uh, oh, florist lady, you know, this is good because that's the product shot. And then, you know, an ad that competes for some other special that takes you to another product detail page on the site for all the sense that makes. All right, so, you know, they asked us, redesign this page without changing the information on it to improve conversion. So we, we took up the challenge. What do you want, what are you just supposed to do on this page? Oh, how did you get that so quickly? Oh, you have my book, okay, well. All right, anybody else? Was that easy? Yeah, view delivery dates. It's obvious, I call this the mother-in-law test. <laughs> if your mother-in-law can figure it out, then it's obvious enough, okay? If she can't, then you're losing money. I love my mother-in-law dearly. But let's take a look at this through the eyes of attention wizard. Now here's the problem with their page. Well, you're looking at the flowers, that's good. That's like good cholesterol, right? That's the hero shot, you want attention there. Then you're looking at the lady, not so good. The giant rose, not so good. Another tiny picture, and then the banner ad at the top. Now how about on the new page? Obvious? Yeah, look, you're looking at the, at the product and you're looking at the call to action and those little involuntary eye movements, those yellow lines, they're called saccades, your eyes jittering and trying to get maximum information, just goes back and forth between them. There's no wasted attention. You see that? Okay, unfortunately, their content management system is so effed up that they can't implement this, so they're still running with their old page, except with a facelift on the outside of the page. Okay, so, sorry, I hate to deliver that kind of punchline, but anyway. One final tool, mock flow. Uh, again, this is free. Oh, by the way, attention wizard, I have some flyers on the end of the rows here, but you can try it for a penny. You know, hopefully that's not too expensive. 10 heat maps for a penny, no joke. Okay, now. Mock flow, why do you need, how many of you are familiar with wireframing? How many of you have done wireframing? Okay, you, how many of you have designed a landing page or been involved in the design of a landing page? Okay, those should be the same number of hands. If you're designing a page, the first thing you need to know is what is it for? What is the functional use of space on the page? What are we gonna devote screen real estate to? Okay, and why is this important? Because, <laughs> If you don't do this, if you say, hey, I just worked a long time on this landing page, and your boss comes in, what are they gonna say? Oh, I don't like the purple polka dot button. I think it should be turquoise polka dot, right? Well, based on what? My friend Avinash Kaushik calls this the hippo effect, and hippo stands for, not because they're fat, but highest paid person's opinion, right? They sign your paycheck, so they have to be right. right? Don't let the hippo decide things. So if you can focus things on the functional use of space. Here's an example, let me just give you a quick one. Okay, they're here in LA. Ed Hardy, who's heard of Ed Hardy? They're a fashion brand, okay. They used to be cool. Okay, now, this was their homepage of their online catalog. Now, what does this say to you? Oh man, to come off of that high, we had to do some downers, like rich, spoiled kids in LA, right? So we're in the right place. Okay, no, but I mean, this is supposed to be a catalog to sell stuff. So we said we worked a long time with them and we came up with a wireframe of the new homepage. 
We figure there are two main types of audiences. People that are there for the first time, they need to know who to shop for. That's the top. And then the fashionistas, they keep returning over and over and wants to know if Madonna wore that baseball cap with the rhinestones and the skull and all that, right? So you want new arrivals and fresh stuff for them, right? Makes sense. They said, yes, 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 and then came back with this. Summer is here. Really? Okay, do you get the sense that there's a men's, women's, and children's shop anymore? No, because they have one picture of a woman looking at her armpit. I don't know if she's smelling it, but, you know, do you get the proper use of the space? Well, wait, 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 because they have shop men, shop women, shop kids. Did anyone read those? Why not? They're obvious. Well, not so much. Anyway, so we said, okay, well, let's back up the train. Let's look at our wireframe. Oops, you didn't quite get it right. Go back and do it again. And this is the one that, the final one we ended up on. Ta-da, make sense? They got all their brand crap in it. They have the dragon tattoos and the clothes and everybody's happy and beautiful, but it actually supports navigation deeper into a catalog. Go figure, okay. That's all I got. I'm gonna ask for two commitments. Stand up again. All of you, I can see you, even in the back. I know you did the same thing in school, trying to sneak out early. Okay, raise your hand and say, my baby is ugly. My baby. Not, not your baby's ugly, sir. My baby is ugly. My baby. Oh, that's not a Sieg Heil either. No, don't do that. Okay, that was you, no? Okay, and the second thing is, I'm going to go home next week and do something about it. I'm going to fix one thing on one of my landing pages. I want to hear you say that. I'll fix it. I'll fix it. Okay, thank you. Now, I think... Um, you may sit down. <laughs> um, we do reviews of landing pages. If you want us to tear you a new one in a recorded GoTo meeting, I'll personally do the first three free. Hopefully that's, not free rather, I'll personally do the first three um, if you want to have your page looked at and deeply diagnosed. So all you have to do is go to, go to our website. This deck will be available so you don't need to write any of this down. Uh, that's how you contact me. I'm pretty accessible. I did a couple of shouts out. I'm going to give away some of the old books. The new books are coming out in April, so if you want to hold out, you can buy the second edition, which is really, really good too. And Conversion Conference. We have five events worldwide every year. San Francisco is coming up in March, Chicago in June, New York in the fall, and also Dusseldorf, for German-speaking friends, and London also in the fall. So check it out, conversionconference.com. If you like any of this, and you want to drink the Kool-Aid, that's the place to go. All right, I, how much time do we have for Q&A? Because I'd love to take some. Corinne, 10 minutes? Okay. Uh, so during the Q&A, if you want to uh, get one of these other books and not thrown at you, I promise, come up to the aisles to the front and just drop your cards. We'll collect them and do a quick drawing just before the break, okay? But, and, and also there's some attention wizard flyers if you want to take a look. So I'll take any comers. I'm going to step up to the mic. Don't be shy or shout it out. Yes. I missed the uh, browser testing part. W w do we have tools for that? Or? Yeah, crossbrowsertesting.com. Crossbrowsertesting.com. Okay. Yep, thank you. Anybody else? Oh, I can't believe I stumped you, or did I scare you, or did I insult you too much? All of the above? Yes? Uh, you mentioned trust as being important. Uh, how important are having t uh, user uh, Testimonials. testimonials. Yeah, that, uh, user testimonials are another form of social proof. They tell me other people have done this and had a good outcome. So they're important, but you have to be careful how you do them. Some people will have lots of text, like actually put the testimonials on the page. Unless it's on a testimonials page, don't do that. What's much more powerful is to say over 30,000 happy users since 2005. Okay, Huge number written out in numerals. And then underneath, see testimonials as a link. Okay, so the methodical people can go read them all, but don't litter the page with even more text. That's, that's probably a net negative. Also, some of you are using another kind of visual social proof may not be so great. You're throwing up those little Facebook things with like all the people like your page. Problem is you have random pictures of people that you can't control drawing visual attention away from whatever it is you really want them to do there. So avoid that as a form of social proof as well. Okay. Yes, question. Say you have a landing page uh, where you, it's a form and you need the customer to fill out six or seven lines. Okay. 
according to what I've seen, that looks like a little bit too much. How do you feel about um, the landing pages that have, you know, you answer like three questions and hit next and there's another page of three questions. Right, so that's a perfect, there's no right answer to it kind of question. That's something you should test. Sometimes having, hey, one and you're done. It's a long form, but this is it. Secure checkout or whatever. Or, you know, let's take you through a simple wizard which gives you bite-sized chunks and asks you simple questions. It's not like, you, who's heard the rule of three clicks? If it's more than three clicks from the landing page, it won't work. Who's heard that? Bullshit, total bullshit. It's not true. What's important, there's a whole body of knowledge around this called information forging theory, is that you feel you're getting closer to your goal. So here's the carrot, right? I'll take a step forward. Oh, it got closer. I'll take a lot of steps forward as long as it keeps getting closer. So as long as I feel or perceive I'm making progress, it, it, you, know, you can have a long sequence. So test that. There's no right answer to whether to do one step or multi-step. Hello, uh, you mentioned the uh, cross-browser tool. tool. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was working on a website and I had an issue where the uh, client was basically saying, well, I can't see it on my phone or I can't hear it. Right, on my okay. Phone. Is there well, a tool for that? There are tools for that. I don't know it offhand. We don't do a lot with mobile, but uh, Cindy Crum, who's a friend of mine, has written a book on mobile marketing. Go pick it up it's called Mobile Marketing. And I know that she's talked in the past about tools. I think they're paid tools that will do cross browser um, testing on different devices and show you what, uh, what they are. Cindy Crum, K-R-U-M, and her book is called, I believe, Mobile Marketing. Is that right, Jeff? Perfect, okay, moxymobile.com, M-O-X-Y, mobile.com. Yeah. And she's very knowledgeable about mobile and, and conversion. Yes? Yeah, hi, um, Tim. Um, what about um, error checking on form filling out? Is there something to be said about that or a tool that yeah. basically optimizes that? I've There's seen no some way to optimize. Really good ones yep. and I've seen some. You, you know, don't need tools, problems. but you do need to build error checking into your forms. Make it easy. The idea is you give people status along the way. If they did it right, you put a green check mark by that field. If they did it wrong, you catch it right there and, and help them correct it. You don't want to have them fill out the form and then get this annoying pop-up that says, you fucked something up, pardon my French. Um, and then go back to the page and not be clear on where you're supposed to interact with it next. So do it as they input it while their focus is on that field. That's kind of a best practice. And there's a lot of Ajax and other JavaScript tricks to, to do nice error validation in line. Uh, definitely do that. Other questions? Uh, okay, if, you, if you're interested in getting a copy of the book, come on up to either front of the, of the aisles, throw your card in there, we'll do a quick drawing. And I'm, I'm afraid that that's all I'm going to bother you with today. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Don't use CAPTCHA codes. All right, don't, Tim, don't thank you uh, very much. Uh, there will be a great rush up here. A reminder, uh, Tim will be headlining at the Improv next week. Is that still on? Yeah, no. Uh, we are going to take a short coffee break now um, for networking and uh, for you to refuel. So please come back 4 p.m. here in this room we'll do our annual pitch fest contest. You're not gonna, uh, no, it's three now, we'll come back. Hey, Karan, is it three or 3.30 or four? Come back at four o'clock for the annual pitch fest contest. Four o'clock, you don't wanna miss